Hi there my friends and welcome to my YouTube channel. Um, today's video is a long one. It's uh, nearly two hours long and I've posted um, a poll on my community tab on YouTube asking if people prefer the long videos or the short videos or a mixture of both and the majority of people were voting for the long videos so <laughs> There you go, you have it. So today I'm working on a piece of Claire Fontaine pastel matte paper with a variety of pan pastels and pastel pencils. <coughs> Excuse me, I have got a cold, so please bear with me. I tried uh, recording a voiceover yesterday, but I lost my voice. So yeah, and then it didn't save anyway. So, <laughs> so yeah, so Claire Fontaine pastel matte paper is um, like a cork texture so when you rub your hand over it it feels like cork but it has got a lot of tooth and I like it because it will take mixed media as well as just dry media it also comes in um, a board format so you can buy pastel matte paper or pastel matte board um, really the board is what you need if you're going to be using say inks or watercolours with a lot of water added because you can do that on this because it is um, suitable for mixed media um, but I've, for this piece because I was just using dry medium I just went for a cut down piece of pastel matte paper now the beginning of this video shows you how much tooth this paper has actually got because it does take uh, an immense amount of layers and to prove this I made a mistake and I was able to cover it up quite easily. My reference image had um, like a fallen tree or a, a tree that was in the wrong place. It was dying, obviously, and I thought I was going to put it in. But as you'll see later on in the video, I decided not to have that there behind the deer. And I just went over it. Easy peasy. <clears throat> OK, so the pastel matte paper, um, you can buy it in pads of smaller sheets, smaller size pads, and they come in a variety of different packs. So you can buy a pack of warm toned papers or cool toned papers or neutral colored papers, or you can buy single sheets up to a size of, I believe 70 by 50 centimeters. That's what I tend to buy. I tend to stick to just a few different colors, a few neutral tones and a, a light blue. They're the, they're the sort of main ones that I tend to work with this one is I believe it's called sand and it's just a very muted brown quite light in color so that's what I'm working on today I've sketched out a fallow deer on a separate piece of paper and then transferred the outline onto this board and then popped a piece of frisket masking film over the top just to protect that area you don't have to do that you could easily work around um, your subject and then fill it in later but I just wanted to keep the fallow deer nice and clean the area where the fallow deer is going to be and decided that just masking it out with a little bit of frisket was the ideal way to go for this um, yeah as I said you can work in mixed media so if you wanted to do um, the background in watercolor you could and then apply coloured pencil or pastel pencil or even watercolour pencil on top that's that's fine plenty of tooth for plenty of layers the pastels that I'm going to be using today are a mixture of pan pastels and pastel pencils so pan pastels if you haven't heard of those before it's a compressed pastel pigment in little round pots they look like makeup um, compact makeup cases they are quite expensive but the pigment goes a long long way and through the years I've only ever had to replace the white I believe so uh, they are expensive as I said you can buy them in sets of 20s or you can buy the full set I think there's about 180 different colors i know it's something crazy i've got about 30 different colors that i've bought um singularly <coughs> excuse me and you can just mix them and 
work with them as you would um, paints really <coughs> oh, excuse me there you go that's the three i'm working with at the moment just a quick flash up onto the screen there um, so if i want to mix a new color that i don't actually have already uh, there's a few ways of going about that you can mix them on the paper or you can mix them on a on one of the pans you know you can add another color to an existing pan to create a different color you won't contaminate the pigment underneath the top layer so that's fine but generally what I tend to do is I'll get a piece of paper like printer paper on the surface next to me on the table next to me and I then apply different pan pastels to that piece of paper create my new color on that piece of paper and then transfer it onto my painting with one of these tools these tools are called soft tools it's like a plastic palette knife with a little foam sock that fits on top and that's what you pick your pigment up with and apply to your painting you can use makeup applicators they work just fine usually find the cheaper the makeup applicator the better so something along the lines of a bag of little makeup tools from the pound shop would usually do the trick so these soft tools and pan pastels are owned by the same company and that was the pan pastel company but they've since been taken over by golden's acrylics they've bought them out no change to any of the quality um, it's just a, a transfer of ownership and all readily available from art stores um, worldwide I believe and obviously available from places like Amazon too so here I'm just adding some different greens and dotting them about with a little bit of uh, white as well speckled in which I'll tint later so tinting is just where you add a lighter colour like white or a light pink or a light yellow and then go on top with a different colour just to alter it slightly to tint it to a different colour. Okay, so speeding through this, I probably won't do a voiceover right the way through because I don't think my voice is going to hold out for an hour of 52 minutes. So what I'll do, I'll explain as I'm going along and then I will stop the voiceover and it'll be nice and quiet and you can just watch and have some music playing in the background if you want to. If you want to fast forward to where I actually start working on the deer, it's about an hour in. Okay, so just applying a little bit more. When, when you're applying greens to a painting, if you've ever looked out your window or if you take a look out of your window now and you can see foliage, there's always a mixture of greens. Every green you can think of in nature is all mingled together. So dark greens, light greens, mid-tone greens, as well as warm greens and cool greens. And in a painting, you can apply just the same effect. Use all the greens you want to create um, interest and dimension to a painting. But the same can't be said for blues. Um, if you're going to create a painting where you've got a subject standing, say, near a lake or a river, the blue in the water is often the blue that is in the sky. It's just a reflection of that same blue, say, cobalt blue or ultramarine blue. Uh, if you start mixing your blues up in a painting, it not necessarily... It, I don't know what I'm saying, do I? <laughs> it doesn't always uh, have the same effect. So it can look a bit wrong if you add too many different blues into one painting whereas green's the opposite as i said greens in nature vary a lot and they all look great in a painting <coughs> excuse me so we're just going for an out of focus effect here in the background i am making all of this background up now it's not in the reference image this the reference image of this fallow deer is actually from unsplash.com you can also look for images on pixabay.com. All the images on those two sites are royalty free, which means you can use them for your paintings um, without any copyright infringement, which is great. I usually tend to work from my own reference materials. Or oh, there's some of the pan pastels in one of the little palettes that you can buy separately. 
to keep them safe and also it's a nice way of holding them while you're painting as well um, yeah if I go out with a cam with my camera um, I'm often just looking for the pose of an animal or bird and um, once I've got a nice pose I bring the photos back to the studio and then work from that pose and often add in detail by looking at other images that I have or that are on the internet so you can always fill in details of a certain species but really it's a pose that I'm looking for to begin with just adding a little bit of interest there putting in a little bit of a, a brown hint going into the background there and I'm literally just picking a little bit of pigment up at a time because the pigment does go a long way so you don't want to load up that little spongy with too much pigment because you'll be going on forever to try and use it all up and if you want to get some interest into your painting it's nice just to vary the the colours that are going onto the paper oh you'll have to excuse me I have got a big mug of hot water with me so I'll keep sipping that so I don't lose my voice again Okay, so just dotting on a little bit more. So yeah, I've taped the Clairefontaine pastel matte paper down to an MDF board, just with a bit of painter's tape actually, it's what I had at hand. And the masking over the deer is by the Frisket brand. And you can buy the um, masking film either in matte or gloss, I have a mixture of both, I'm, I'm not really bothered which one I use, it's whatever one's on sale and then I, I buy quite a bit of it. If you ever, ever have any problems getting masking tape or frisket tape or frisket film or any kind of tape off a painting, um, if you're frightened it's going to rip the paper then just heat it with a hairdryer first and it just it just sort of loosens up the stickiness of the tape and when you're peeling off if you're peeling off masking tape from around the edges of a painting always pull away from the painting and not towards the painting and that lessens the risk of uh, damaging your painting as well so just got that top right hand corner out of the way for now I do go back into it um, while I'm creating the rest of the painting but uh, I've covered up that fallen branch to a certain extent uh, that's enabled me to move on with the rest of the painting. When I work through a painting, it's nice to work from the back of the painting towards the front of the painting. So I get the background in and then the mid ground, then the foreground and subject. That's just the way I like to paint. Um, and it enables me as I'm doing that, if I, even if I'm working on the foreground, I can still go back into the background to balance the painting out. So you'll see through this video that I do sort of go from one aspect of the painting or one area of the painting to a different area of the painting backwards and forwards. And that's just me balancing out the painting as we go. And that's balancing out in contrast, balancing out in um, how out of focus something is or how detailed and in focus something is and it's just nice um, just to do that and um, those of you that follow me on social media <clears throat> will know that I'm actually building a new studio at the minute oh no I must be mad I'm actually doing a full garage conversion at the moment and I'm doing it myself so with the help of my dad as well my stepdad Fred um, my dad passed away in 2001 and my mum's remarried and I call Fred dad, he's lovely. So uh, yeah, so my stepdad's helping. We've got uh, the floor joists down and things like that. Just having a, a break at the moment from building the new studio um, because the next step now is getting the garage door taken down and the brickwork and big picture window put in place. 
I'm actually having somebody in to do the brickwork because that's not something I trust myself with. I don't mind joinery and things like that, the carpentry side of things. But when it comes to bricky in, if it was at the back of the house, I'd have a go. But being it's at the front of the house, no. Um, my husband's cousin, Gareth, they go, Gareth, you've got to mention, is actually going to do the brickwork and window fitting for me. So that's great. So that's the next step. So in January, which is only a few days away now, but some point in January, that part of the uh, construction will be underway which is great and as soon as the new studio is finally finished um, I will do a studio tour video I know a lot of people have been asking me about that and yes I will do it and I will do a video of storage solutions and things like that for art materials so at the minute I'm actually having to work out of our spare box bedroom and it's not the tardis I hoped it'd be it's uh it is tiny and I'm actually surrounded yeah literally just surrounded by all my art materials and I'm working having to work in a space that is about three foot by five foot so not ideal and this size painting is about the limit because anything bigger and I won't be able to step back to have a proper look at it so um yeah, so a bit restricted at the minute, but looking forward to the new studio. Oh, yes, please like and subscribe. I've popped that pop up on um, more to remind me than anything else to say. If you'd like to see more videos, then don't forget to subscribe and hopefully YouTube will send you notifications when new videos are released. OK, back to this one. So same again, going on with I think there's about four different greens going in there with a little bit of it looks like white but it's not it's a very very pale blue very light blue sort of white with a, just a hint of cool blue and it's just mixing that up a bit so we don't want anything in the background to be in focus <coughs> we know it's foliage of some description and that's all that matters um, and obviously I've popped the finished painting at the top left hand corner so you can see what, what I'm working towards. So the reference image of this fellow deer as I said is on unsplash.com but it's in a herd of other deer and I just picked out this deer I thought that'd be nice um, as a standalone piece. So if you just type, go on unsplash.com, type in fallow deer, I'm sure there's plenty of, probably hundreds of fallow deer photographs that you could work from to create a painting of your own. So this looks time consuming and I guess it, it was, but it was, oh, this painting was such fun to do. It really was. I, I'd got lots of coffee on the go as always, me and coffee my spirit animal is coffee <laughs> and I was probably listening to either a podcast or I had YouTube playing in the background something along those lines and just a nice relaxed atmosphere while I was working so yeah brilliant I love it I feel very blessed that I can do this for a living and uh, even if it was a, just a hobby as it was before um, yeah just very blessed to be able to create artwork and enjoy it and also to enjoy looking at other people's artwork too so it's nice to be able to appreciate other artists work as well if you're a beginner or an intermediate artist um, don't look at other people's artwork and think oh theirs is so nice um, I might as well just give up now no look at other people's artwork that you admire and just think yeah if they can do it I can do it you know we're all on the same journey we're at, you know we're all at different stages along the journey um, and as long as you're enjoying your journey that's all that matters I hope everybody had a fantastic Christmas if you celebrate Christmas or if you don't celebrate Christmas, hope you had a nice break from work or you got to see family and friends and things. That's always nice, isn't it? Just taking a break from normality and uh, chilling out for a while. Did anybody get any art supplies for Christmas? Or you've treated yourself to any new art supplies? 
I've treated myself to a few bits and bobs, but nothing really spectacular. Just uh, filling up my stock, really, while there were some good deals on on Amazon. <laughs> that everybody shops on Amazon now, don't they? So I'm literally just picking different colours out of those little pans that I showed you earlier and just popping them on very randomly. <coughs> and being random while you're doing this is quite important because if you think about what you're doing too much, it, you end up creating a pattern and that's not what you want. So while you're doing something like this, if you want it to be completely random, try thinking about something else. Or as I said, you know, listening to YouTube or a podcast or have a film playing in the background, something like that. And it just stops you, it inhibits you from um, concentrating too much on what you're doing. And hopefully by by doing that, you'll be able to create something that's randomised as opposed to patterns. Just going on with darks, mixing it up, light to dark, dark to light, going backwards and forwards, either way it works. If you only want to work dark to light, then do it that way. But I just generally just work both ways. So just pop in the little um, soft tool into the pan and then just pop in a little bit of colour on at a time. If they mingle together on the paper, that's fine. If they mingle together on top of the pans, that's fine too adds to a little bit more variety in the painting. So I wonder if right now any of you that voted for longer videos are regretting your decision. <laughs> yeah, so hopefully once I'm in the new studio, um, there's going to be a lot more room to uh, video all different things such as, let's have a think, stretching paper. I've already popped a little video on about stretching watercolour paper that's on the YouTube channel now but I'll also be able to video things like mount cutting I've got a mount cutter that nobody's ever seen me use I do use it um, but I've never videoed that and that's something that I'd like to put on my YouTube channel as well they're quite inexpensive these days the mount cutters and they're really easy to use you don't need to be a mathematician to work the measurements out and things it's quite simple and it's quick and it does save money my mount cutter has paid for itself really quickly because buying a big piece of mount board and cutting several mounts out of it is much cheaper especially if you're working um, at a size that isn't a standardized size <clears throat> so maybe you're working um letterbox size and you're doing or letterbox style painting so it's an unusual shape and size maybe five inches by 12 you're not going to be able to get an off the shelf mount of that uh, dimension and if you go to a frame makers and ask them to cut you a mount for that particular size it might cost you quite a bit more than you know, buying an off the shelf cut mount. But if you buy a full sheet of mount board, you can easily cut that yourself. You've got loads of um, leftover mount board to make all different shapes and sizes. You can get mount cutters that do ovals and circles. I've not got anything like that. It's, I don't think it's something I'd use, but that is uh, an option if that's the route you'd like to go down. And all of the little inserts, so when you cut a mount, the bit you take out of the middle, if it's too small to cut another mount of, that's not waste, that can be utilised. You can use coloured pencils on it, you can use pastels on it, you can coat it with clear gesso or white gesso and then paint on it, so nothing goes to waste at all. Even the smallest piece of leftover mount board can be used for something, Christmas tree decorations, things like that. Um, so yeah, no waste if you buy a mount board cutter. Turning it upside down now, just, you don't have to. I just like, oh, I'm not turning it upside down and decided it against it. <laughs> okay, so 
Yeah, when you're working on a painting or a drawing, I like the freedom of being able to rotate my painting to make it easier for me. I know it's not ideal for filming, but it's whatever gets the job done quickest for me. And if I, I've had problems with my shoulder with rotator cuff muscle uh, in, in my shoulder before, I don't want to aggravate that. Um, it all started, I've worked as an artist for a long, long time and it all started because I was keeping my arm in um, a certain position for a long time and it just caused problems with my rotator cuff muscles in my right shoulder. So now I know not to keep my arm in a fixed position for too long and it's thankfully it's uh, all settled down, doesn't play up anymore. So by turning the board round makes it easier for me to reach areas in case of instead of leaning over the painting to reach them but I've decided I'm fine doing it this way adding a little bit of like a steel greyish blue to the background there the little pans do have numbers on them uh, sorry colours on them on the underneath of the pan it shows you the name of the colour and pigment information as well um, but really I, I really don't go if I want to colour in the background in the background I don't I just look at the pan and if it's the right colour it works if it's the wrong colour that I've picked up and doesn't work I just put it down and pick up another one if it's something I haven't got like I said I just mix a new colour myself okay just applying a little bit more to the background nice out of focus background adding the blues into the background and a few cooler greens will push the background further back from the viewer so cool colors um, look like they're further away <coughs> excuse me warm colors look like they're closer to the viewer so that's really something to keep in mind while you create a, a painting especially if it's from your imagination and you're making it up as you're going along I just keep that in mind and obviously things further away get them more out of focus if you can things nearer to the actual subject if the subject is going to be completely in focus then everything around that subject needs to be in focus as well and then obviously coming towards the front of the painting the, the things that are closer to the viewer I tend to knock those out of focus too so we've got an out of focus background, uh, slightly out of focus foreground and everything in the mid ground where the subject is, especially in this painting, will be in focus. Obviously with a painting this size and a subject that is quite small, you can only put so much detail in in any way. So if I wanted to have a deer that was highly detailed, I would have either done this whole painting a lot bigger, which obviously I can't in the studio I'm in at the minute, um, or I would have just done a head study or an, even an eye study if I wanted to go really in depth with detail. Think about these things before you start a painting. In preparation I like to do a few thumbnail sketches and what that is, it's not a sketch the size of your thumbnail, I wouldn't fit anything in that. It's uh, just a little really really rough sketch, normally about the size of three inches by two inches or two inches by two inches or something like that depending on the composition I'm going for and I'm just really with a um, pencil a normal graphite pencil just a really quick sketch so no detail just general shapes of the subject that's going into the painting and where the lights are where the darks are where the con main contrast is going to be all of that just gets quickly scribbled out on a piece of paper gives me a rough idea um, of how the contrast and the subject and the composition are going to work in the final painting not everybody does it some do some don't it's worth giving it a try though <coughs> excuse me So adding just some out of focus leaves and tree canopies there. Obviously you can see in the final painting I do have some rays of sun coming down. Like I said none of this is in the original photo um, that was inspired by. 
it's just the deer really in the original photo i just like the the pose of the deer it's beautiful and i was so relaxed doing this painting it was lovely and i think that shows if you i don't know about you but when you're working on a painting sort of how the painting is going to affect you while you're working on it and how you affect the painting while you're working on it is different with every single project creating this painting just made me feel so relaxed and i'm hoping that that is something that you, viewers will feel when they're viewing the finished painting as well it's a nice atmosphere it's a relaxed atmosphere quite serene um and that's how I felt when I was creating it. It was lovely. My phone's ringing in the background. It's buzzing away on the table, but I'm going to ignore it. Uh, it's sure it's not something important. I will just reach around and have a quick look. No, I can call those back later. Sales. Okay. So... Here I've mixed a little bit of that steel blue colour with a little bit of the light blue and the light green, just making sort of a muted, a muted tone there. <coughs> As I said, if you you know you're interested in pastels and you haven't tried pastels before, I'd recommend you just get a few pastel pencils to begin with and just have a play with those before you start. Um, splashing out on pan pastels and things like that if you've painted before with a palette knife then and then and enjoyed it then you probably would enjoy creating artwork with the pan pastels and those little tools because it's very much like painting with a palette knife it's the same sort of feel you get um applying the pigment using um a blending tool just to soften some of those edges you can use your finger but it's this is nice because you're not depositing any of any oils from your fingers onto your painting using one of these tools and these are very very inexpensive you can get sort of a pack of 10 for a few you know two or three pounds and what i generally do is i have quite a lot of these little paper it's like a compressed rolled paper you normally see people using them to blend graphite and charcoal things like that what i tend to do is have a bunch of these just for pastel work and i'll have a few that i just use for blues a few of them i just use for greens um, a few of them for just light colors and a few of them for dark colors and uh, so you're not contaminating the pastel work that's on your paper i have seen people sharpen these um, blending tools I don't uh, they go quite feathery and rough if you do that and uh, what I do is I just get a microfiber towel or a, an old t-shirt or something cotton and I just wipe it clean on that and that does it for me that's fine I have separate ones that I use for graphite and charcoal because I don't want to contaminate my pastel work with uh, any graphite or charcoal that's another thing when you're first um, sketching out your subject um, your, for your painting I sketch out on a separate piece of paper I make all my mistakes um, sketching wise on that piece of paper and once I'm happy with that sketch I'll transfer just the lines that I need over onto my Clairefontaine pastel matte paper either by the normal tracing method with a piece of tracing paper or I'll use some um, trace down, graphite trace down. Uh, once I've got my initial lines on the Clairefontaine pastel map board, I go over it very, very gently with a rubber to lighten the lines so they're nice and uh, light, <laughs> so they're not too dark and then apply my pastel on top. And the reason you don't want dark graphite lines is graphite in general is shiny um, and it doesn't play very well with pastel sometimes, so less is more. You know, I only need guidelines. <coughs> That's all the graphite lines were there, would be there for, it's just guidelines. And they're all gonna be covered up anyway by pastel. Don't Oh, I know what I'm doing. So I was gonna say, I don't know what I'm doing there, but I'm reaching across to my iPad 
So on the left hand side of the easel is um, like a chest of drawers with art supplies in. On top of that is a little stand with my iPad in. That's where I've got my reference image. So generally, unless I'm teaching, I don't print off any reference images at all. I have them all on my iPad and I just work from that. Uh, the thing is, is if you print off, right, that's a Carbothello pastel pencil, just adding some little, what I'm assuming are like mayflies, little flies that, that have been caught in the rays of the sun. And they're not in the background. They are round the deer's head. So um, just adding them in there, softening some of the little highlights out there with a the soft tool. I can't remember what I was going to say. Oh yeah, in lesson teaching, I don't, I generally don't print out any reference images. Um, I f don't feel I need to. I'm not, um, I'm not too concerned about colour. It's more about contrast um, in a painting. I've seen some people, they'll print out a reference image and they'll have it right up next to where they're working um, on their painting and their colour matching like mad uh, that's not fun for me um, I want to work with colours that work for me and work for my painting and sometimes what you see in a photograph won't always work well in a painting so just keep that in mind if you really want to, oh that's another thing if you're working on a commission of a pet someone's pet then yeah you need to be true to colour you need to do like for like because the owner will know if you've got the colour wrong but when it comes to wildlife uh, in general well life in general a subject under one lighting scenario will look a different colour to the same subject under a different lighting scenario so you know colour can vary keep that in mind but yeah, I don't print out, I work from a screen. Okay, so we're moving into the mid-ground now. I'm not saying the background is finished, I will keep popping back and adding a little bit to it, but now I've decided to move forward and start working on the mid-ground. And the reason I work from back to front is because everything in at the front is always overlapping something in the back and everything in the mid-ground will overlap something in the background so it makes sense to work from the back to the front of the painting. So adding some lights in, just mapping out really. It's not because I want to work light to dark, it's because you can go both ways. It's just a case of in my mind, I just want to get onto the paper what I have in my, in my mind. <laughs> yeah if that makes sense. So just mapping out where I want some taller grasses. Obviously as things come towards the viewer, they're going to be, they're going to, um, oh, they'll become more and more uh, detailed as they come towards the subject. So just keeping that in mind as well. And as you can see in the finished painting, there are so many greens all different greens as I was saying earlier just start mixing up the greens just because it is standing in a a green clearing in a forest you don't just want to have one big patch of green because it would just look wrong you need you you know get that very variness variance oh god so I've got a cold <laughs> that's my my excuse I'm sticking to it but you know what I mean just yeah Keep the variation going throughout the painting. <coughs> Any questions, pop them in the uh, comments below. I do read them all and I answer everybody. And I'll put all the I'll put a link to all the materials and everything that I'm using in the description below as well. So I'm hoping to release this video on New Year's Day, which is Sunday. It's Friday today. Friday that I'm doing the uh, voiceover. This was filmed earlier in the year, but uh, just haven't had a chance to get around to doing the editing and things being so busy. Days turn into weeks and weeks turn into months. And yeah, I know I'm not on my own. I know there's a lot of busy people out there and some of them manage to release a video on YouTube once every two weeks or even some 
uh, once a, a week and it's just mind-boggling how they do the editing. But if people can cope with this style of video that's uh, quite unedited and just sped up to 300%, um, that's fine. And then I'll just do the voiceovers and it's an easier way for me just to get uh, some pan pasta was being shown there in one of the trays. So that's how many I'm working from now. And there's different pigments on top of a light green and that's how I like to work as well, mixing different colours on top of one of the pans. You won't contaminate the pigment underneath. And when I've finished this painting, all I do is get a soft tissue and just wipe across the top surface of that pigment. It'll take the loose pigment off the top, leave the compacted green pigment underneath. So don't worry about contaminating underlying pigments. <coughs> <clears throat> adding a bit of variety now and a little bit of texture not um, texture that's standing up off the painting obviously because it's a dry medium but just um, to make it look more textured as we're moving forward through the video through the video through the painting oh my word <laughs> and different shape um, tool these tools coming four different shapes these soft tools and the little sponges that fit on top um, are like for like so you've got pointed ones square ones rounded ones there's there's three or four and you buy the plastic uh, tools once and then you can just buy the little sponge covers as needed the rough of the paper obviously the quicker these little sponge tools wear out and have to be replaced the little socks sponge socks <coughs> excuse me but they're quite economical and yeah if you're using something like a sanded paper obviously you might get through a couple of those little foam uh, socks per painting depends how you use them working on the smoother paper that obviously they're going to last longer because there's not as much wear and tear So just backwards and forwards with greens and might be colour mixing on a little sheet of paper while we I'm back. So it's working really well and um, I, I just yeah as I was saying thoroughly enjoyed this all oh, the drawers to the right let's so those colored drawers on the right hand side of the um, easel <coughs> excuse me I've had them years I bought them from B&M and I don't know they're probably designed with all the rainbow colors to go in a children's bedroom or something but it works brilliant for me I keep all my pastel pencils in there so I've got two sets one set of drawers on top of another the top set of drawers I've got all my Caran d'Ache pastel pencils in split into uh, colour families so pinks and browns and greys and yellows and blues and greens and then in the bottom set of drawers I've got all my other um, brands pastel pencil brands um, but all in colour families so mixture of brands but in colour families and it works great yeah I love that it's amazing what you can find when you shop around <coughs> and everybody's storage systems and how they like to keep their art materials is going to be different um, that's just how I like to work coloured pencils I tend to keep in the trays I bought them when I use them um, I get them out on the desk in colour families. That's how I work with colour pencils. Watercolour paints and things like that. Some are in their original packaging. Others have been squeezed into... If I've bought tubes, I've, I squeeze them into pans, let them dry and then work from dry pans. You know, everybody's different. Obviously, oil colours, acrylics and things like that will stay in their tubes till I need them. 
and paper storage because I buy these this Clairefontaine pastel mat paper in large sheets as I do watercolor paper and then cut it all down to size when I'm ready to use it all of that is stored in large boxes under my bed so we've got one of these beds you know where you lift it up and there's loads of storage underneath that's all aren't materials under there <coughs> some people keep clothes and shoes and things under their beds and that's weird I just keep art materials under mine. I do have a large plan chest um, that does hold paper, but at the minute that's being stored at my in my parents' garage because obviously my garage is no more a garage now. It's a work site, a construction site, but it will be coming back. And then a lot of the things that are under the bed will be moved back into proper storage in the new studio god it's so exciting <laughs> be so glad when it's done though yeah my husband's so patient just living in a building site at the minute so now we in the background we were adding or I was adding little dots of colour because I wanted it to be really out of focus. Now working forwards in the painting, <coughs> I'm doing more vertical strokes with the soft tool. So building up the depth. And it's great because you can pick up two colours at the same time. Um, so I can use that little, you know, tool. And on one edge, I can pick up a light green and on the other edge I can pick up a dark green, apply both at the same time and you get a sort of a two-tone effect. Really good. It's worth having a, a play if you've got those tools and the uh, materials at home and you've not thought of trying that before. Saves time. Yeah, picking up two colours uh, at the same time. So what I'll do now, I'll leave it ticking over. I'll stop the voiceover for now. I'm losing my voice. I'll let the video carry on. <coughs> and then I will pick up again further on into the video and describe what I'm doing when there's a little bit more to see. Okay, so I'll stop the recording now.
And I'm back. I've had a, a nice glass of water and my throat's feeling okay now. So I thought I'd pick up here. Now I'm starting to add some detail. So all the underlying base coats are now complete on the background, midground, and foreground. And now I'm going in with a Karen Dash, which is one of the um, softest pastel pencils I have, and starting to add a little bit of detail so some highlighted areas in the grass and just very random as well but not taking the strokes right from the bottom of the grasses up to the top because it's only the tops of the grasses that are going to be catching any light so they're obviously going to look a little bit lighter so yeah I've got uh, all different brands of pastel pencils uh, Karen Dash, Derwent Faber-Castell, De La Rowney, Pip Pastel, Conte Pastels and I do find that the Karen Dash are generally the softest. softest. Obviously it depends on the colour. Some colours in different brands are going to be softer than other colours in, in the same brands. So just bear that in mind. You might want to test out a few of your pastel pencils and find which ones work better for creating highlights. Um, but yeah, the Karen Dash are great for this. <coughs> I sharpen all of my pastel pencils with a knife and then um, sand them down to a point if, then, if needed on a piece of fine sandpaper. There is a video on that um, that I've popped onto my YouTube channel about how I sharpen my pastel pencils if anyone wants to take a look. Okay, now working on the deer itself. So I've removed the frisket and now I want to get the lights in so anywhere on the antlers where the sun's going to be hitting the front of them I do want it to have a slight um, highlight running down the front so I'm going to apply that first and that is with a Carbacello pastel pencil so I need a pastel pencil that's going to be a little bit harder retain the point for a little bit longer because the actual pastel pigment is harder and just getting some highlight in there <coughs> excuse me so that's something that I don't want to lose so I want to get it in first these highlighted areas obviously if I had gone in dark already you still could put the lights on top that's a Derwent pastel pencil now that I'm using and just switching between them whichever colour I need so get those lights in first and that way there's less chance of me losing those lights later in the painting so it's all about contrast. There's not a lot of contrast in this painting, but there's just enough to make it look natural, I believe. I didn't want to hype up the contrast too much um, in this because it was more about um, sort of a serene, gentle feeling to the painting than anything else. So I don't know if I'm looking for colours now or looking at the <laughs> reference image or I don't know what I'm doing, but yeah. I might have even been having a sip of uh, coffee. Going in with a pit pastel. They're a little bit of a harder pastel. And picking up sort of a flesh tone there. So going in with a little bit more detail. So you could do the base coats with a pan pastel on the deer. But um, you're less likely to be able to go into finer areas. You know, smaller areas because of the size of the tools that you use with a the pan pastels so I'm choosing to work with the pastel pencils now turn the um, painting upside down obviously to save my shoulder but also just to make it easier to access certain areas of the painting and this is why I like to work um, on a board that I can rotate even when I'm working on acrylic paintings oil paintings and things I do like to be able to rotate my board or canvas um, just so it's um, an easier way of working. <coughs> Excuse me. And obviously if you turn your painting upside down, turn your reference material the, the, that way as well. Actually you would end up with a headache. <laughs> well I would, yeah. Obviously if I'm working from life, if I'm out plain air sketching, I can't do this because I can't ask um, a deer or some oh there you go some colours that I'll be working with um, can't ask your um, subject to stand, do a handstand or anything so when you play air sketching when I'm playing air sketching 
Obviously, I don't turn anything upside down for that reason. But plain air sketching, I wouldn't be putting a lot of detail into my uh, drawings or paintings anyway from plain air sketching because it's time. Um, and obviously weather as well, being in the UK. You're not always guaranteed a day full of sunshine to sit and paint. So if I go out plain air sketching, I'm looking for poses again and comp a composition maybe contrast things like that a few rough sketches a few watercolor washes and then i can create a full painting from those once i'm back in the studio uh spare bedroom <laughs> uh soon to be studio i'll keep going on about it because i'm so excited it's uh brilliant but those of you that work from maybe a dining room table or things like that yeah i've been there done that um Whatever works, isn't it? You know, wherever you can get your art supplies out and create a painting or a drawing, you do it because um, even if you've got a tiny spot in the corner of a room, it's better than nothing, isn't it? Or even if you're just sitting with um, a drawing pad and some pencils on your knee on the sofa, that's good enough. Or some people that are, if they're ill and they're you know creating artwork while they're sitting in bed that's great you know you're creating and that's the main thing so wherever you can create just make the most of it make it your space if you can a little bit of purple going in because obviously the antlers are covered in velvet or they were when this the photo of this deer was taken so blood supply going up through the um, antlers um, creates the hints of pink and purple and I just thought purple's nice because there are hints of purple in the background <coughs> and I've put a hint of wild irises in the midground as well if you've noticed just a tiny tiny hint of purple in there as well if you go into a painting and you just happen to pick up the wrong colour and place it into your painting Sometimes you can sort of disguise it, go over it, layer over it, or sometimes you can erase it. But if it's a colour that you've put on by mistake and there's no way of taking it back out of a painting, just pop that colour into other parts of the painting and it will look like it's meant to be there. It'll create a balance that looks correct so nobody needs to know except you and obviously nobody ever hangs their well not that I know to nobody ever hangs their finished painting next to um, their reference image so um, the only person that will know is you and as long as your painting looks correct that's all that matters and as I said colour changes with the time of the day you know with the weather conditions things like that so uh, don't be too worried about colour. It's more about contrast and composition to create a painting. So because um, the deer is in going to be in focus, there's going to be a little bit of detail added, obviously not too much because of the size of the subject. And that will be mirrored in the amount of detailing around the subject as well. So using a variety of colours, a variety of pastel pencil brands as well. I'm really cho choosing the brands just for the colours at the moment. That's a light pink that's going that was going in there. That was one of the De La Rowney pastel pencils. If you wanted something to stay completely white then either go in with a, a white pastel pencil first and get that white in. Or you can, if you don't mind working mixed media, then you can actually go in with a white coloured pencil, sort of wax or, or oil-based coloured pencil. But just be aware that once that is down, you won't be able to go over it with pastel. It sort of repels the pastel. That's something to keep in mind. <clears throat> but say you're working on a slightly bigger subject and you want um, part of a highlight in an eye to remain completely white and you don't want to contaminate it with any pastel or anything like that, then yes, use a coloured pencil, wax or oil-based coloured pencil, get that white in and it'll stay white throughout the rest of the um, 
pastel application. So that's a Derwent pencil. The Derwent pencils have got the um, dark red barrels to them and they've got an end cap with a colour on but I don't normally look at end caps uh, for the colour I look at the leads themselves and just choose my colours by looking at the actual lead it's very very rarely that I will swatch out any dry mediums I do swatch out most wet mediums though if you've ever looked into a pan um, sorry a palette of watercolour paints that have dried Sometimes you can't tell the dark greens from the dark blues and things like that while they're dry. So it is nice to always have a swatch card that you've made yourself so that you know which colours you're picking up and what they're going to look like once they're wet. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm not going to be able to do much voiceover, I don't think, until my voice runs out. Just have a sip of water. I'm back and that's a very very light pink in the De La Rowney um, brand obviously when you're working on a pastel painting don't lean on or don't rest your hand on any of the painting that you've already created because you will smudge it the this pastel matte uh, Claire Fontaine pastel matte paper there's hardly any fall off at all when you're working on this there's no need to fix it once the painting's finished um, just mount it put it behind glass and it's good to go all of the as far as I'm aware all of the pan pastel colors are all light fast as are most uh, pan pastel pencils as well so just pop it behind a mount then behind glass frame it and you're done really and back the right way around oh the antlers are looking good now I like those and, and now you can see why I've put that um, light yellow at the front of the antlers on the front facing edge of the antlers it just um, makes it look like the sun's hitting the antlers catching the light getting a few darks in now so I don't lose where the eyes are, where the nose is and it's just a matter of taking your time and just building up the layers nice light layers, you can always add more but if you add layers that with too much pigment and you feel too much of the tooth all in one go <coughs> it can be um, tricky to add more detailed layers on top so less is more, you can always add more but it's hard to take away. You can lift pastel off of the Clairefontaine pastel mat paper either with a piece of masking tape or scotch tape or even with a putty rubber but you uh, nine times out of ten you can't actually get back to the colour of the paper underneath because the pastel does stain it slightly so make sure you're just putting down light layers take a break every now and again when you're working up close to a painting like this it is nice to keep stepping away having a look at it from a distance <coughs> obviously I can't do that in the tiny room I'm working from at the moment there's not enough room because if I, I can back up about two feet then I've got a bookcase behind me so what I tend to do or what I tended to do and um, working on this was take photographs on my mobile phone and then a mobile phone I wouldn't be able to take them on a landline phone would I oh dear just take a photograph on my phone and then have a look at the painting on my mobile phone and by looking at it in a smaller digital format you can pick up um, things that need to be altered you know your eye sees more looking at it like that it's like stepping back from painting in a bigger room and deciding what needs altering, what needs more colour, more contrast, etc. I've recently finished a large um, Amur Tiger pastel painting, and because it was larger than this one, I was having to take it into another room 
um, prop it up and step back and have a look at that because I couldn't even get a full photograph of it on my mobile phone. I couldn't get back far enough away from the painting <coughs> to fit it all in frame. And when you are working, um, creating artwork, keep giving your eyes a rest as well by looking out of the window or looking at something as far away as possible just to give your eyes a break from looking at something so close up. So I'm actually resting my hand on a mole stick at the minute. And I, th I think these the mole sticks were originally created for sign writers. I think it was sign writers probably using them. So they were they, so they had a steady hand for doing the fancy lettering and things like that. But they weren't actually resting the hand on their uh, work surface. <coughs> this one was uh, bought from on Amazon or somewhere. I think they've got like a a ball on one end. <coughs> And you rest the ball um, on either on your canvas or I tend to prop it on top of the board. I'm holding the bottom of the mole stick with my left hand <coughs> while working um, with my right hand because I'm right handed. And it just keeps your hand and your arm off your painting, keeps everything clean. So you can use that if you're oil painting, acrylic painting or just drawing in general. And I do generally like to work standing up at an easel. If you're putting sort of wet washes onto watercolour painting, things like that, I'll work with that flat on a table on a work surface. But I do like prefer to what to work standing up. That's one of the Karen Dash pencils, nice and soft. And the art light I'm working under and filming under is washing out the colours a little bit. The painting on the in the top left-hand corner is true to life, so the, the colours are much more vibrant than you're seeing on the video. So it's a perfect light to work under though, but not so perfect for filming. And definitely not perfect for photographing artwork either because it's too light, too light, too bright. It is a daylight um, art lamp. I'll put it. I'll link the the light in the description below as well. So obviously, working this a subject this small, you can't get a lot of detail in, especially uh, in pastel. But you want to create texture, so you know you might think of a fallow deer as being a reddish brown with white spots. But that, you know, if you just did it like that, it would look so flat. So, um, like we did in the greenery, just get a lot of mixes of colour going into the painting um, to give it the subject form and interest and te texture. And if you put a colour down and you're not happy with it, just carry on and glaze over it with a different colour, a colour that's more um, pleasing to the eye and more realistic. I've been asked to do um, a stag, a big, I know, a red deer, a big stag, but um, a lot of people do them and I'm just after a, a little bit of inspiration to do one that looks a little bit different, maybe a different kind of setting. Um, so if any ideas, uh, pop it in the comments below. If you've any subjects that you'd like to see me um, create or any mediums that you'd like to see me work in, then please pop it in the comments below as well. I work in oils, acrylics, obviously pastel, coloured pencil, ink graphite charcoal do I do digital drawing as well digital painting as well so anything you'd like to see just drop it in the comments below and I'll add it to my to-do list
it was nice saving the subject till last actually because it's obviously my favourite part or not obviously but it is you know it's I'm a wildlife artist so the actual subject itself uh, animal or bird you know reptile or amphibian whatever it's always my favourite bit and it was just nice in this case that it was saved to last some of that purple colour coming in again <clears throat> which is nice because we've now got the purple a hint of purple in the background and a hint of purple in the foreground and midground and adding it to the deer as well just pulls the whole painting together And going backwards and forwards so I don't just do one area of the deer and then move on um, once I've done one area of a subject uh, I, I will always carry on building on it as I build on the rest of the subject it's like the background um, the surrounding foliage and everything I pop backwards and forwards between each bit balancing everything out adding color or taking away color I'm really happy with how this painting turned out and uh, it's framed and in my home so although I never say never to selling something but I want to keep it for a while very self-descriptive isn't it watching this it's just lots of light layers and I'm not pressing down with any of these pencils <coughs> excuse me I'm just letting the texture of the paper just grab the pigment <coughs> excuse me and that's enough and it, I know that way I'm not filling up the tooth of the paper too quickly as I said it does take a lot of layers as long as you work with a light hand and it, by working this way, it does enable me to alter the colour um, of the pigment I'm laying down quite easily, tinting it and blending the colours together on the paper. It works really easy if you're using a light hand. Whereas working the background, midground, and foreground out of my imagination, I'm actually looking at the reference image now just to make sure that I'm getting the um, markings and things in the right place. Not necessarily highlights and things because I've made the lighting situation up myself, but um, some of the highlights are in the photograph, some aren't going on with the carbothello this is a creamy color but it's not too yellow so it's uh, it's not got too much of a yellowy hint to it it's more of a neutral cream back in with that sort of purpley color And I've just carried on and just put in a sort of a russet colour across the body and back. And now just putting the markings in on the rump and tail. And that's a Faber Castell. Um, pastel pencil they're a little bit harder so they retain a point a little bit more oh and I've just noticed uh, I added whiskers to the just underneath the deer's chin as well still quite a way to go though just building up the colours very gradually and if you're ever adding black 
to a painting. Um, I never add black on its own. If something looks black in a photograph, in reference material, I either want it to look like a warm black or a cool black. If it's a warm black, I'll be adding sort of burgundies and reds and reddish browns under it and over it. And if the I want the black to look cool, then I'll be adding lilacs, blues and purples to the black as well. Now that's the black going on now. I've already added some undertones to it, some purpley undertones. And now just a little bit of black going on top. If you just add black on its own, it can look very flat and not very natural at all because all colours reflect light. Black reflects um, colours around it as does white. <coughs> so you never really get anything that's pure black, you know, jet black or pure white. But I just need felt the need that to darken this a little bit more. But what you don't want to do, you don't want to just darken that area and nothing else in the painting because that will stand out a mile. Then the contrast between that and the rest of the painting would be too high. So people's eyes would be drawn towards that instead of the painting as a whole. Earlier I was talking about adding cool colours to the background and warm colours to the foreground. And you can see in the completed painting that I've had quite added quite a bit of warm tones to the foliage in the foreground and um, bottom left hand corner and that just pulls that bit of foreground closer to the viewer carrying on with the light layers still lots to do but I don't know about you, but when I'm working on my artwork, whether I'm painting or drawing or sketching or, you know, just doodling in general, the time just whizzes away, you know, it's um, before you realise it, you've missed lunch time and it's closer to dinner time. Uh, it's just so relaxing. I love it. I love every aspect about it. I love going out and taking photographs um, getting back home and opening up the PC and <coughs> scrolling through photographs and being inspired and it's just lovely. It's just to just get lost in it all. I'm never enough time to do everything that I want to do. There are some subjects and things that I do want to do. I'm planning to do some bigger paintings once I'm in the studio, especially acrylic paintings and things where on canvases that I've not got room for at the moment and big drawings too and big pastels I mean this Clairefontaine pastel map paper goes up to 50 centimeters by 70 centimeters um, so some nice big pastel works too and some mixed media uh, works that are a bit larger as well charcoal and pastel that works nice together and watercolours and coloured pencil, they work nice together as well. Get the watercolours on because coloured pencil can be such a slow medium. So it is nice to have something underneath like a watercolour, you know, get all the washes put on first and then work all your detail with coloured pencils. That's a nice way to work and a bit quicker than doing it all in coloured pencil. As long as it's all archival, it works for me. Whatever saves time generally is the route that I'll go as long as it's archival oh the the Clairefontaine pastel map paper and board is acid free so it's completely archival it won't um, affect any light fastness in any of the materials you're you're working with so that's that's great it is a a quality paper it can be quite expensive but when you think the amount of hours that go into a painting or a drawing it's well worth spending that little bit extra on you know a decent quality paper just blending those um, colors out there pushing them down into the tooth of the paper with my finger very quickly adding some green to the underneath of the deer 
because obviously some of the light from the grasses and foliage underneath it will be reflected back up to the underneath of the deer so I just wanted that to um, show that's not I don't think that's in the um, reference image but you want to you don't want to your subject to, to look like it's been cut out and stuck onto a painting you want it to be part of the painting as realistic as possible unless you know that's the sort of thing you you want to go for if you're working in a more stylized style but for me real it's all about realism so getting those little things like you know foliage reflections and things like that is is what I like to do If you haven't already, please like and subscribe. It does help my uh, YouTube algorithms. If you like a video, YouTube is more likely to share it with um, other people. And obviously, if you've got friends or family that like art or like wildlife or might want to get into art and haven't yet, then please share my videos with them. It would be really appreciated. You could share um, the YouTube videos on Facebook or Twitter or MeWe or LinkedIn, anything like that. would be really appreciated. Thank you in advance if you if you do. And if you haven't already, please follow me on social media too. <coughs> the links are in the description below and. Uh, Hopefully we'll be one of the first to see the studio come to life when it happens in this coming year. <coughs> Excuse me. Add in some markings now. And these don't have to be exact. I mean, all the fallow deer in the world are all going to be different from each other. So as long as they're right for the species they don't have to be right for the individual it's whatever makes the painting work as long as it looks real just getting a little bit of texture going on there so this is I guess you could call it detailing but it's not really because the subject's so small it's more of a case of getting a feel of the texture of the hair making sure that the markings and the texture is running in the right direction for that species. Using a few different colours, a little bit of tint in there, that's glazing really so I've put the texture on with a light colour a creamy colour and then if it's showing up too much I just <coughs> excuse me glaze over it using the side of a pastel pencil with very little pressure just letting it glide across and it will just tint that cream colour to whatever uh, colour I'm using at that moment As I said in the beginning, this is speeded up, I think it's 300% um, sped up, so uh, oh, if only I could work that quick. But would it be as enjoyable? I don't think so. Even if you could create something this quickly, I, I think um, you'd probably lose lose some of the enjoyment in it. You'd probably be in the Guinness Book of Records, though. <laughs> little bit of glazing again just glazing over those lighter areas just don't want them standing out too much 
and just when I rub it with my finger like that I'm just patting it down blending it very slightly I'm not trying to disturb it too much now there I was so I get put a little bit of pressure on with the edge of my thumb there <coughs> just to get um, a softer blend little bit more green going in now I've added all the um, markings put base coats down the legs and adding a little bit more green to the underneath of the deer he looks quite pot bellied there doesn't he because the angle of the uh, camera angle but if you look at the finished painting he's a normal shape I promise And some more reflective green going up the legs. Back with the mole stick. And adding just a, a warmer tone down the front of the legs. That's a carbothello. They're quite soft. They're, if, I, if anybody ever asks me which pastel pencil to start with, that's probably the brand I'd um, suggest, I'd recommend to start with because they're a nice mixture between the harder brands and the softer brands. And you can literally do everything with a Carbothello. You could do this whole painting with the Carbothello pastel pencils. It'd take a lot longer, obviously, especially with the grasses and things, but you could do it. And there's there a nice range of colours in the Carbothello range as well. I think the full range, I don't know if it's 60 colours or 72 is the full range for the Carbothello and they're very well priced as well. They're not too expensive. The most expensive ones are the Caran d'Ache. Currently, I should say. So a little bit more texturing down the backs of the legs. I know it's hard sometimes to decide when a painting is finished. <coughs> and you could literally go on for hours and hours, if not days and weeks, adding more to a painting. But at some point, um, you've got to decide when to stop and call it finished. Because, you know... you. You're only going to get so many paintings done in a lifetime and I want to do a lot and I'm not going to be able to do that and experiment with more techniques and more subjects if I'm spending too long on any one painting. So at some point, if what you're adding to a painting isn't making an awful lot of difference, then you can probably say that it's finished. <coughs> and in the famous words of Leonardo da Vinci, a painting is never completed, it's um, merely abandoned. So, uh, but uh, abandoned with love, I think. When you think you can't go any further, just stop and uh, stop, sign it. If it's pastel or anything like that, get it behind glass. If it's um, an oil or acrylic, wait till it's dry. Um, the recommended drying time and then get it varnished and framed. And then move on to your next project. And while I'm working on paintings, nine times out of ten, I'm thinking about what I want to do next anyway. So in my mind, I'm often thinking, oh, right, OK, so I'm coming to completion on this one. So what do I want to do next? And I start having ideas about subjects or compositions or maybe a colour, maybe um, working in this and I've worked with purple maybe I'd be thinking I want to do something with more purples and lilacs and pinks in next time you know so oh that was my stomach I hope you didn't hear that <laughs> it is lunch time <laughs> adding some final details now around the grasses and foliage because it was looking quite um, bland under there, it was looking quite flat. So adding some highlights there, 
gives that grass a bit of a lift. Add in some more wild irises by the looks of it or some grass seed heads or I don't know what they are, I was just making up as I was going along. It can, Or they could be, I don't know, wild crocus maybe, I don't know. Wild orchids or it could be, yeah, clover, I guess, in the smaller areas, the shorter grasses, there could be some wild clover in there. But yeah, just making it up, adding a little bit of colour, randomly placed, pulling the whole painting together. But nothing, nothing that's too detailed or that is going to stand out too much that is going to take the viewer's eye away from the deer. Because obviously the deer is the main focal point in, in this uh, painting. Just about um, six minutes left to the end of the video. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've learnt something. I hope you take something from this video, sort of a technique that you'd not thought of, or I hope you've been inspired to try new subjects that maybe you've not tried before, new medium that you've not tried before, even if it's not this medium. Uh, on my channel, I've got watercolours and dry dry mediums you know and ink tents which is a derwent product a water soluble ink that's fun to work with you get nice vibrant effects with that you could work with ink tents on the clairefontaine pastel mat maybe you you've worked with pan pastels or maybe you have pan pastels and you've not worked with them yet i hope it's inspired you to give them a go experiment have fun it's your journey it's your life um life's for living it's not a spectator's sport and i can't go a day without creating something even if it's just you know doodling or sketching um it's just part of me and who i am and if i don't get to create i do feel a bit yeah down like i've wasted a day that's silly i guess because no day is ever wasted um but yeah hope you've enjoyed it please like and subscribe if you haven't already and follow me on social media if you wish um, and if you're interested i do teach monthly workshops um, at wwt martin Meir. that's in the uk just one workshop a month over there and i alternate the workshops between watercolor and pastel And it's all wildlife inspired workshops as well. <clears throat> we do um, mammals and birds and hopefully in the new year we'll be doing reptiles and amphibians too. Or a mixture, who knows, I've not decided, I've not planned that far yet. <laughs> but we've done owls, tigers, foxes, um, beta, so different species of birds, different species of mammals, all fun. Red squirrels were, seemed to be a favourite with people, so that was fun. Using the side of the uh, pastel pencil instead of the tip, just to make some out of focus marks on there. So there aren't any particular species of grasses or anything, just random markings, just to it takes the foreground out of focus, puts more emphasis on the in-focus uh, parts of the painting in the mid-ground. And it looks like, I'm, oh, I thought I was working off screen and that would have been clever. <laughs> That's a very hard pastel pencil. Uh, it's like a dark bottle green, just getting a little bit of... Um, variation in contrast into the grasses under the deer because the deer would be cast in a little bit of a shadow not a defined shadow shape but just a little bit of uh, cast shadow
making it all random again. A few more highlights going on. Little wisps of grass and maybe seed heads and things like that. But nothing too definite, nothing too distinct. And as I said, if you put it in one area, put something in one area of a painting, make sure you put it in other areas too. Just so it doesn't look like an accident, it just makes it look purposeful. Using the side of the pencil again because I want these pieces to be out of focus. Blending it out with my finger just to soften the effect a little bit. And don't forget once you've finished a painting make sure you sign it. So I normally sign either in the right hand bottom corner or the left hand bottom corner. It all depends on the composition of the piece. If in doubt just write your name on a piece of paper, lay it in one of the corners and see how it looks before you sign the actual work. I do believe we're coming to completion now. Like I said, you never know when to stop. <laughs> so you could carry on forever doing something like this. Oh, I'll just add a little bit more here. I'll just add a little bit more there. But at some point, you've just got to say, right, that's it. It's not making a huge difference to the overall look to the piece. And also, if I'm adding detail on a piece this size and I can't see it when I'm two foot away, then there's no point in adding it, really. A little more bit of the uh, limey green. And there he is, finished. Hope you enjoyed today's video. I know it's been a long one, but you did vote for longer videos. So uh, there'll be more like this to come. If you want shorter videos as well, then that's fine. Just drop a comment in the comment box below. And that's it for today. Um, stay safe, everybody. Stay creative. Have a fantastic New Year. Stay safe if you're going out. And I will see you all in the New Year. Take care. Bye-bye for now. Bye-bye.